Hello everyone, welcome back to uh, our series God's Revelation with uh, His Grace Bishop Yusuf. This uh, time we'll talk about chapter 19 and uh, by the end of chapter 18 we finish the destruction of Babylon, the final judgment. So from now on it's going to be more of a joyful theme, yes. right? <laughs> yes. So in this chapter, Sayyidina, it starts with, After these things I heard the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord of God. This is not the first time we hear this, maybe third or fourth time we actually hear that, that in heaven uh, we praise God for His glory, for His honor, for His salvation. Yes, Alleluia here was repeated in this chapter four times. Yes. The Alleluia actually, Hallelu means praise. Yeah, Jehovah. God. So, praise God, praise Jehovah. So the first time actually was the people, the righteous people in heaven, they actually praised God. Why? Because salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord God. When they saw the victory over Babylon, Babylon was a very tyrant kingdom. Mm. And uh, when the people saw Babylon, Maybe they questioned whether this kingdom one day will be fallen, but now God actually destroyed in, in twinkling of an eye yes. you know, this power. So they say, wow, salvation, glory, honor, and power belong to the Lord God. Mm. And they actually, they, they said it twice, hallelujah, for emphasis that it's Praise is, is befitting God and becomes Him. In response to this, we can see how the 24 priests and the four beasts or four incorporeal creatures, they, they worshiped God and said, Amen, Alleluia, yeah. which means the heavenly and the earth still participate in praising God yeah. for His victory, for His salvation, for His power. Yes. Then after this, a voice came from heaven and instructing everybody to praise God, praise our God. All you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. great. Everybody. That's why the last one uh, was beautiful. Mm. Like a great multitude, sound of many waters, sound of mighty thunders, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reign. Mm. So let us be glad. Let us rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Mm. So with the end of the kingdom of the devil, Babylon, now the consummation of the marriage between the Son of God and his bride, the church, is, is about to happen. Mm. That's why everybody is blessed. It's a beautiful image mm. how everybody is rejoicing, praising God, uh, happy for the victory of God over the the. The, the evil. Time, yes. So, of course, this is what the church is waiting for, right? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, but uh, when we come to verse 7, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Can you please talk about this yes. verse? Our relationship with God goes in different stages. stages. And it, it's, it's like a marriage. God said about himself, he's a bridegroom. And there's a parable of the virgin, of wise virgins, the foolish virgins, who are his bride and uh, he's a bridegroom. So the proposal happened in, in the incarnation of the Son of God. He proposed himself to us, whether to accept him or to reject him. Mm. You know. And uh, when we accept him, that's like the, the engagement. Mm. We know accept to, to be Christian and to believe in him. Then the engagement will turn into betrothal. Betrothal is like a civil marriage when we are baptized. So the period before between believing, believing and, and, and being baptized, baptized, this is the engagement. Then when we are baptized and participate in the sacrament of the church, anointed with the mayroon, repenting, confessing, and uh, taking communion, this is a betrothal. Betrothal means we are like, like civil marriage. We are his bride, but the consummation of marriage, the complete union between Christ and us, hasn't happened yet. Did not happen, but we have the pledge, mm. like, like in the betrothal. 
That's why in, in the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, he said, I have betrothed you. Hmm. So it, it's, it's a betrothal. But the consummation of the marriage will happen at the, the second coming, after the end of the kingdom of the devil. Hmm. Then in the second coming, there will be the consummation of the marriage. And with this consummation of the marriage, with this complete union with the Son of God, the full adoption by God the Father will happen. Now we are completely one with the Son, so we'll be completely adopted by God the Father. That's why in Romans chapter 8, St. Paul spoke about how the creation are waiting for the adoption. Mm. And he said the adoption is the redemption of our bodies, mean when we are raised, our bodies are raised, that is the, the full adoption. Mm. And this will explain a very important verse in the letter of St. John. Those who are born from God cannot sin. Mm. And many people stumble over this verse. Are we children of God, but we are still sinning? You know? But yes, we are still sinning because the complete adoption did not happen yet. But once the complete adoption through the complete union with the Son of God will happen in the second coming of Christ, then we cannot sin. How can I sin while I am one with God? That's why in verse 8, it explains the inability to sin by saying, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen and clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Mm. So it will be granted to us. And the righteous act means we'll do everything right. We'll not do anything wrong. Right. We cannot sin. sin. You know, and, and um, you know how, how the bride wears white dress on, on her wedding. Mm. So here is the same image. It is the purity, it is the righteous act of the mm. saints. And since this moment, actually, we cannot sin mm. after the complete adoption. That's why in, in heaven, there is no sin. Although we have free will, but yes, we cannot sin. Not. Then, starting from verse 11, it starts giving us another image about God that he, he who sat on a horse, he's called faithful and true. But then, you know, many like characteristics of God that we probably talked about some of them before. But in verse 13, one of them is very beautiful. It says, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. I want here to make a reflection a little bit about the horse. Mm. On Hosanna Sunday, the Lord entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey. donkey. Here on a horse. Mm. What's the difference? In the parable of the wicked vine dressers, the Lord said, the stone, if somebody fall on the stone, he will be bruised. Mm. But if the stone fall on somebody, crush. crush him to bow. What does this mean? The stone is Jesus. So in the first coming, he came humble, meek, riding on a donkey. So even those who rebelled against Jesus, they will be bruised. Mm. And the goal of these bruises is to lead them to repentance right. and to believe in him. But in his second coming, that's why the first coming, you know, fall on, on, on the stone. Mm. So the stone is beneath and the person is falling on the stone. But second coming, he's coming from above, you know. Now, there is no time for repentance. Mm. It, it, it's over. He's coming to judge with righteousness. That's why he's coming on a horse, mm. not, not, a, not a, on a donkey, you know. Yeah. And those who rebelled against him, be he will crushed. crush them into powder, mm. into powder. It, 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 there is no time for repentance here. Mm. So that's why he said, the heaven opened and pulled a white horse, and he sat on him, called faithful, that's a son of God, true, unrighteous, judges and makes war. So it's a time of judgment. But as, as your reverence mentioned, in spite of, of this power that he is coming with on a, on a horse, but his clothes is dipped with blood. Mm. He smeared with blood. That's the blood that he shed on the cross the to save us, yeah. you know. So, yes, he is powerful, but he is our sacrifice, he is our Passover lamb. So when the righteous see him with this robe that is actually dipped in blood, they will remember the great salvation that he went through and, and he shed his blood in order to win this victory for our sake. Yes. 
in order to make us his bride, in order for us to go to heaven with him, to, to be his bride and inherit the kingdom of God and be children of God the Father. It's a beautiful image. Yes. In verse 16, another you know, characteristic of God is that he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So what is that a symbol of that uh, it's written on his thigh? You know, the kings of the, of the earth, they think that they are powerful, but they forget there is king of kings and there is a lord of lords. Mm. So regards how powerful you are, but there is a king of kings and, and uh, a lord of lords. Usually they put uh, the sword, you know, uh, around the thigh, right. the, the, the thigh. So this uh, a symbol of his power. But there is also a beautiful meaning. They say that the, the rope symbolizes the church. Mm. And the thigh symbolizes his incarnation, yeah. his body. So here, actually, the church is powerful. And in his incarnation, he's, he came actually to defeat Satan. Mm. And, and that's what happened on the cross. He uh, defeated Satan. Mm. On the day of the cross, he carried the cross on, on his shoulder. But now he, he's carrying the so sword on his, on his side, side yeah. because now he's coming to judge. Yeah. Uh, the time of mercy is over. Yeah. So he's coming, coming to, judge. To, to judge the world. The, the word coming of mercy is over. God's mercy will not be over. Right. But what I mean for the wicked people, the yeah. time of the repentance is, is, is over for them. So there is no mercy for those who did not show mercy or practice mercy. Mm. Just I want to explain sure. this to anybody misunderstand yes. <laughs> what I said. In verse 17 he says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. And then he says that you may eat the flesh of kings, captains, uh, mighty men, and horses. So it looks like there is still a last battle here. Because in verse 19 it says, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse. And then uh, they were captured by God. Yes, Babylon is the greatest kingdom in evil on earth. Mm. So after the fall of, of, uh, of Babylon, the people who, who cried over Babylon, they, instead of repenting and returning to God, they still have hope that they can actually mm. uh, reestablish the kingdom of Babylon. You know. But here the angel who, who is in the sun, sun means he is manifest to everybody. 